All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Hopefully, everyone can see and hear me. And welcome back to Solar Noon Tuesday. And uh, we'll go ahead and start with the news of the day, as per normal. Uh, this is the news for the week of September 3rd. And there, it's actually quite a lot of interesting things going on in the world of solar at the moment. Let me slide a little bit over here out of the picture. Um, there's a shakeup at Toledo Solar. Um, those of you may be familiar that there are two major solar manufacturing companies that have started from the University of Toledo. Uh, first Solar is the largest and the first, and they primarily service the utility scale um, world within film panels. And then there's Toledo Solar, which is trying to get into the thin film market for commercial and um, for uh, residential. So anyway, so um, solar was installed at the governor's mansion here in Ohio by Green Energy Ohio. It's a volunteer organization that's been operating here in Ohio for a number of years. They installed this system in 2004, and at that time used first solar panels, because of course they were manufactured in Ohio, um, and, and that was the system that was installed. Well, in 2002, uh, they decided they were going to replace these panels. They got a little long in the tooth. So um, so Geo and, and Toledo Solar were working together to replace the solar panels on the governor's mansion. Uh, they were replaced with Toledo Solar panels, and then First Solar came in to take the old panels and recycle them. Well, the technician um, came to get the old panels and looked over the new installation, found out that the panels that had in fact been installed, at least according to the technician, were actually first solar panels that had been modified where the serial numbers had been replaced, claiming to be US made Toledo solar panels, but they were actually Malaysian manufactured first solar panels that were being installed. So essentially pulling the label off, sticking a different label on. Um, that led to a lawsuit. It's led to a shakeup at Toledo Solar. A lot of people getting fired or resigning, you know, in quotes. Uh, and we'll see how that's resolved. Uh, lest we think that uh, Toledo Solar or the first solar is blameless on this, I did read a different article that showed that apparently an audit showed that their Malaysian manufacturing plant was using slave labor. <laughs> so, uh, so nobody's hands are clean in this, but uh, it sounds like it's a mess. All right, there was a report from the Energy in Information Administration, the U.S. government, that about 86% of all of the power that was installed on the grid in the first half of this year came from renewables. If we look at those numbers a little closer, we see that um, there was 56.1 gigawatts added in, in the first half of this year and 14.5 gigawatts of capacity uh, retired. Of the initial, of the additions, 52% of what's been installed is solar, 17% um, battery, uh, and 13% wind. They consider nuclear as a renewable. Uh, and then natural gas being the only fossil fuel um, that was added to the grid, and that represents about 14% of the new additions for this year. Of the retirements, coal, coal is essentially being phased out. 62% uh, of coal power plant or of those that are being retired were coal, and 36% of, of natural gas. So uh, I think from what I've read in the past, about 75% of the coal power plants that exist today are, are going to be phased out over the next five to 10 years. So coal as a, as a electrical generation um, fuel, that day is past. Um, a study by Climate Powder, Power, which is a industry group, um, has found that 80% um, of all of the uh, capital investments for clean energy that are largely the result of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act are going to Republican-held states and congressional districts, which is fascinating since every single one of those Republican elected officials voted against this act. So uh, they are, of course, benefiting from it, but publicly voting against it. Uh, for example, Tennessee, 
in the last 12 months received $7 billion in clean energy capital investment, which represents about 80% of all of the infrastructure capital investment within that state during that time period. Uh, Primarily, this is electric vehicles. It's also storage systems, batteries, whether it's the manufacturing of batteries or the installation of capacity that's going to be integrated into the grid and solar. Uh, They anticipate that this investment so far in the last 12 months has created about 5,600 jobs. And since 2019, about $15 billion has been invested in the state of Tennessee in in clean energy, creating about 11,000 new jobs. And speaking of that transition from um, fossil fuels to renewables, uh, S&P Global Commodity Insights has just issued a report and their analysis shows that about by 2042, 75% of the uh, power that's being used within the United States will come from renewable energy. And they basically say that number is is locked in. It's it's baked into the pie. Um, Even if we see dramatically lower fossil fuel costs, they just simply will not be able to compete against renewable energy. Um, But to reach some of the very aggressive goals from the Biden administration, for example, their goal is 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2035. Uh, This research is saying those goals are probably unrealistic, uh, that to get to 90% uh, renewables, Uh, of all of the energy that's consumed in the marketplace, we're going to have to see a lot of investment in long-term storage, carbon capture, advanced nuclear and hydrogen. Uh, My personal um, uh, bugaboo, which I I feel is not technically ever going to be. But anyway, um, but if fossil fuel prices remain low, that target will be difficult to reach. So looking at baked into the pie of about 75%, 80% in that range, but to get to 100%, probably pretty unrealistic. Um, There was a ruling in mid-August by the U.S. Department of Commerce on the uh, Oxim uh, solar lawsuit. This lawsuit had to do with um, the fact that the tariffs that were imposed on Chinese imported solar panels um, the the Chinese moved manufacturing to primarily four countries, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And so the lawsuit basically said, hey, this is a transparent attempt to try and avoid these import tariffs. Well, the the Commerce Department just ruled that, yeah, Captain Obvious, right? It 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 is in fact um a transparent attempt to try and avoid those tariffs. Now, the Biden administration, because of all of the disruption, uh, uncertainty because of the penalties and tariffs that are associated with this, had put a two-year moratorium on uh, the import of uh, those panels from those countries. That's going to end in August of next year. So we're going to see another disruption. Um, But to give a little history of what's been going on, China identified solar, silicon, cells, modules as a a targeted industry they wanted to dominate, and they, in fact, are pretty good at it. Uh, In 2012, the U.S. ruled that they were dumping panels in the U.S. In 2018, tariffs were imposed on panels coming from China. Then it was discovered or determined uh, that that they were using forced labor, primarily in the Uyghur district of China. So in 2022, there was the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which prohibited the import of panels from those regions. So a lot of these panels have been now redirected to Europe that has not acted in this way. And we've seen a steep decline in prices in Europe a glut of panels on the market. And now because of a lot of these uh, actions in the US, China is threatening to limit photovoltaic exports to the US, similarly to how Russia determined to limit exports of natural gas in Europe. So a lot of market disruption going on there. And that's part of the reason why the Inflation Reduction Act really tried to then redirect domestic manufacturing here to the United States to try and deal with a lot of this international disruption, the boom and bust cycles 
Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing a lot of that taking place here. But whether or not it's going to be ready by mid 2024 is is kind of anybody's guess. All these announcements say that they're going to be manufacturing by early to mid 2024, but things happen. So uh, we should anticipate some supply chain disruptions, I would assume. And speaking of some um, uh, innovations within the solar industry, uh, there is a new plant. It's a Singapore-based company called uh, Byla Solar, and they're opening up a manufacturing facility in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, they're saying it's going to be operating by mid-2024, of course. That's the target time for all of these companies. Uh, it will create about 250 jobs. And uh, the interesting thing about this particular panel is it is glassless, no glass in this thing, and frameless, no frame. It's basically a flexible silicon solar panel. So it's not a thin film panel. It is silicon, but it uses a polymer um, coating rather than glass as a protective element. Uh, they're arguing that it can go in places that regular solar cannot. Uh, specifically, they target for solar canopies. They target for the top of buses, vehicles, also um, roofs that cannot support a lot of weight. Um, so, so that's kind of their marketplace. Now, the interesting thing, because I dug into this just to see just how robust these are, even though they weigh 70% less than a regular solar panel, they still have competitive efficiencies, about 19% efficient, whereas a typical silicone panel now is 22, 23%. But they do also have 25-year warranty. So it's not like the 10-year warranty for a thin film panel that you often see. So uh, I found this kind of an interesting innovation because a lot of the issue around how do we keep declining the cost of solar is that there's kind of the cost of glass, the cost of metal, that's all fairly fixed. Um, so we've got to come up with ways of using less material in order to uh, keep this uh, innovation and lower costs proceeding. Okay, so that's the news from the solar industry for this week. Does anybody have any questions on that particular bit that we've touched on here? And I'll remind you, if you do jump in, if you could flip on your camera, that would be helpful. Give you just a second. Right. All right, so then I'll go into some of the announcements. And again, feel free to interrupt if, if anything comes to mind as we move forward. Um, so September 6th, we have, and that's today, um, or no, sorry, tomorrow. Uh, there's a concentrated um, utility scale uh, webinar on at 2 p.m. Then there is the 7th at 1.30. All of these times are Eastern, so, you know, make, make adjustments. Uh, there is a webinar that's being offered on prevailing wage and apprenticeship. This is part of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, where in order to qualify for the incentives that are available on commercial and utility scale projects, uh, the installer must pay prevailing wage, basically union wages. I believe this is on projects over one megawatt. So uh, need to check that or maybe attend that webinar to find out. And I can I can provide you with links on this, but I would just say I'm making you aware of these webinars and you just do a search and, and you'll find them. So rather than try and give you links. There is a conference, uh, the RE Plus conference there, uh, September 11th through the 14th. This is in um, Las Vegas. And uh, so a lot of industry hype going on around that. If you're in that region, in that area, or wanting to attend, that might be a good conference that, that you might want to take part in. And then there is on September 12th, Solar United Neighbors is having a conference about community solar or a webinar, sorry, 5.30 in the evening. And then on the 14th, we have a EV charging partnerships so this is more uh, utility scale level, but uh, if you're interested in uh, EV charging and how to work with the utilities, this is a, a webinar uh, designed for that. And then of course, uh, shameless advertising, Blue Rock Station is still offering uh, some courses. We have some hybrids that are underway at the moment, um, and but you can still jump in 
catch up and do the face-to-face if you're wanting to get industry certification. It's a quick and easy way. You can go to our solarpvtraining.com website to um, to find out more details. And we have one coming up in December. Then uh, then we have a face-to-face class at uh, Zane State College in, in January. So those are the events. Anybody else want to throw out an event that I may not be aware of or a webinar or uh, anything of that nature? Everybody's being quiet. All right. Well, let me jump into um, the discussion topic that that I thought we would uh, maybe touch on here. Um, and, and this has to do with the Enphase Sunlight Backup System. And this is a new innovation, well, relatively new, um, that Enphase has put out there. And uh, so let me first touch on just exactly what this is. It's it's um, with the Enphase um, IQ8 series of microinverters. They've begun to um, be able to operate in a standalone mode when the grid goes down. So this gets back into the rapid shutdown um, provision within um, within inverters. That is a requirement of of the UL seventeen forty one standard. That as soon as the grid tied inverter loses sight of the um, electrical grid, it's designed to shut down. This is to provide or to prevent back feeding onto the grid, um, because obviously a utility worker who's out there working on the utility thinks that the grid is down. Now, hopefully, they're not making bad assumptions. But if you're back feeding onto the grid when the grid is down, uh, not operating properly, then you may um, inadvertently kill or or injure a utility worker who's out there trying to repair the lines. So all grid tied systems are designed or all grid tied inverters are designed to shut off as soon as it loses signal from the grid. And that's the rapid shutdown provision. Or, or sorry, not rapid shutdown, anti-islanding provision um, that's within this so that you're not an island of power in a sea of darkness. So um, so microinverters, of course, are designed to be grid-tied inverters. Well, with the IQ-8, they then came up with the concept that we could use these IQ-8 system and then integrate it in so that it acts like it's a... Um, a grid interactive or a, uh, in this case, an AC coupled system. So hopefully I can walk you through some of the components here. Uh, Of course, there are solar panels on the roof and those solar panels are going to each have an IQ8 series microinverter attached to them. So the concept of microinverters is that each one of these panels is now going to be generating AC electricity, uh, all for, for convenience sake, going to be referring to these as like the 240 volt single phase um, AC that most homes in the United States operate under. But there are three phase systems uh, that are also available, microinverters. So this system, the, the power, the AC power will then run down to a combiner box that combiner box takes multiple branch circuits. Um, so you don't refer to these as strings because they're connected together in parallel. So this is going to be a branch circuit. And because of the ampacity restrictions of each of the uh, cables that connect to these microinverters, uh, it really is a 20 amp limited uh, cable size. I think it uses 12 gauge wire. And uh, so 20 amp capacity means because of the safety margin, only 16 amps can flow through that uh, wire. So that, because of the output of these microinverters, uh, limits the amount of the IQ8s. I should have double-checked, but it's either 11 or 13 uh, in a branch circuit. So if you have more than that, you're going to have multiple branch circuits. So Enphase has a combiner box, which I'll show you in a little bit more detail a little bit later here. And that combiner box can take up to four branch circuits. Um, So 40, 50 panels 
coming into that particular box. If you have more than that, you can get two combiner boxes. Um, now, within that combiner box, they have their communication device. Uh, they call it their um, uh, the gateway. Uh, it's part of their... Um, uh, they have all these cute names, like there's N power, which is their switch and N charge, which is their battery. And this is, uh, uh, it slips my mind, but it has one of those N, N names there. Anyway, um, so Enlighten, that I knew as soon as I stopped that. So the gateway connects into their Enlighten monitoring system. So that's all built into that box. Then there's a system controller. That's essentially the smart switch. That smart switch is an auto disconnect. So what you're doing is you're running the power into that auto disconnect and it's monitoring the utility grid. If it sees the grid go down, it then switches to standalone mode. Uh, and in this diagram, there's also a uh, system shutdown switch that has to do with the rapid shutdown provision where if a first responder or the utility comes to your house, you're in standalone mode, they want to turn off the power, they can turn off at that system shutdown switch, and uh, the whole system goes down. Batteries, sunlight, uh, everything. It's turned off there. Um, then, uh, typically, this system will connect into your main panel uh, and, and then feed a backup load panel. So uh, that's typically how that works. So essentially, when the grid goes down, the switch disconnects the system from the main, which then means it's disconnected from the utility, and then it redirects power to the backup load panel. And then it is required that there be some sort of load controller because this is operating without battery backup. So the amount of power that's available is variable. So if a cloud passes in front of the sun, you lose some of the power. So whatever your backup loads are, you have to be able to prioritize them to program it. So it says, all right, if I have enough power to run them all, I'll run them all. But if I don't, this is the sequence in which I'm going to shut down those loads. And, and that's all available and, and programmable and everything. So, um, so that is the concept. Very nice and clean. Um, the reality, well, I can just sort of speak to some of our um, experience here because uh, this is the system we decided to uh, install here at our offices. So this shows you, um, just the photo here shows you the array that we insp installed here, relatively small array, 15 panels. Um, we had designed it to be 20 panels, and you can see this small little shed can receive an additional five panels there. Um, but because we didn't have a lot of history with our um, production, or with how much electricity we use here, uh, I didn't want to you know, install the full system just yet because we are restricted to only producing up to 120% of, of what we consume. And I think 15 panels will do it, not sure, but I wanted to get everything set up so we could expand it to 20 panels, no problem. And in this photo, if you see, there's a little junction box right there on the wall and an electric vehicle charging station. Now, that was a little bit of a side issue because I sort of fell for some of the Enphase marketing that said, hey, if you buy this Clipper Creek charging station, it is fully integrated into our Enphase system, which in my mind was bi-directional charging. So I can now use our electric vehicle as a backup battery system for the um, for our, our building. Well, that's not the case. Um, they're they're sort of kind of hinting at that, but but not. Um, you know, it's it's marketing. Um, any any charging station is integratable into um, into Enphase. It's an AC system, so you plug in any charger, and it's going to work. So um, this is uh, a bit of uh, misleading marketing at the moment. They did tell me that they're upgrading and that it will be bi-directional at some point, but I'll have to buy a new charger at that point. And they're not really sure if this smart switch 
is going to be able to deal with that. Well, the smart switch costs like 22, 2300 bucks. Um, so not really keen on swapping that out. So that's, we're not ready for prime time with bi-directional charging just yet. So um, again, I'm going to just reinforce if anybody has any questions as I go along on this, just jump on in because uh, otherwise I'll plow straight on it. Okay, so what what is visible from the outside? Let's see, I see Eugene, you've got a, a question there. Gonna have to unmute. Yeah, um, real quick, that the end phase diagram you just had up, the backup load panel, is that an intelligent load panel that you buy from end phase? How does it prioritize uh, the circuits in there? Yeah, the the backup panel can be any sub panel. You know, it's it doesn't have to be one of the intelligent sub panels. Um, the load controller unit that you buy and and you have to buy um, is where it prioritizes. That's all integrated into the smart switch, but then executed at the load controller box. So I'll I'll show that, and you connect the sub panel to the load controller. I don't know, and I don't think that it would work with, say, you go out and buy a smart panel, because uh, all of these things are communicating through a Bluetooth thing with Enphase. So I think you got to kind of stay proprietary there. Um, but it is just a regular old, you know, um, sub panel that any electrician could install. Oh, good. Yeah. <clears throat> AJ, um, yeah. I, uh, uh, with the sunlight backup, I believe you are uh, restricted or recommended to limit your loads to 30% of the amperage or wattage on the roof, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. And of course, it would be uh, either way, you're going to come out with the same result. But they're basically saying, yes, we don't want you to. Actually, it says, I think that the most demanding load in your in in your um, system should be restricted to 30% because they're fine turning off loads, but whatever yeah. that most demanding load is uh, cannot be more than 30% of the, um, of the use that of your panels generating capacity. So they're, they're anticipating that in dawn and dusk and in cloudy conditions, your system may, may not generate anywhere close to your capacity, you know, your watt capacity of your uh, array. So in this case, the array output, the AC output is like 4,500 watts. So I would have to be restricted in my backup to 1,500 watts at any, at any particular time. Uh, how they control that, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's kind of out of their hands, but they do give you a lot of warning that that is in fact you know, that may damage the equipment or whatever, if you try and power too big of things, which is weird because they give you some 240. Um, you know, it's all based on 240, those those switches and prioritization. And to my way of thinking, most of the backup loads I, I would look at would be 120 loads. Um, so you just control those in parallel, you know, where you hook them into a 240 breaker system and both are turned on or both are turned off at the same time. Um, but I couldn't see myself wiring in like a hot water heater as my critical load because uh, it's just too demanding. Um, you know, for example, critical loads that we selected were um, the communication system here in the building so that I have a modem and I have, uh, you know, an office. That was the critical one. The second was the electronics that control the, the gas heater. So it is a gas furnace, but there's blower fans and there's um, uh, thermostats and things like that. So it's not a big load. Mm -hmm. And then a refrigerator freezer, that was the, uh, the third critical load. And then we also wanted a sump pump in case the power outage had to do with a flooding event. So those were the four critical loads that we decided to back up here, but we could have gone with eight, but we'd have to install a second load controller. So at the moment, we're just going with four critical loads during during the power outage. Any any other questions on that? Hopefully touched on that. That's a good point there, uh, Siggy. 
Yeah, I have um, a, a question, yeah. but not not exactly that. But you you mentioned earlier that uh, grid tied systems look for signal from grid. Um, yeah. I wonder sometimes what are they exactly looking for? Is it frequency or is it voltage? And how do they know it's not there anymore if they generate and match and synchronize themselves? So that's always like puzzled me a little how that works. Yeah, well, in the event of, of this system, it is mimicking the grid. So it's fooling the inverters into, comp into operation. It's just integrated into a system that's disconnecting from the grid at the same time. So it must be a combination of frequency and, and uh, voltage. Mm. Um, but I've heard that some people can use a generator to try and mimic that in the same way, but that most generators are not, you know, as, as clean, I guess, or, or they tend to have more variation. So sometimes you can kick on and off your inverters and cause some damage because the signal they're looking for is not pure grid signal. But we, but usually, yeah. don't, um, we usually don't allow um, solar in parallel with a generator. Um, yeah. I, I, I think there could be a conflict because the inverters, they like to raise the voltage. And if they raise the voltage and there's not enough load, then you may have a conflict with the generator. Yeah, that, and, and you can and, you can blow out your inverter if you yeah. if you hook it in with a generator, and and it, so it's not a good practice. But that doesn't mean people don't try it. Yeah. So the, the other question I had, and it came up like last week in the class, um, we we read an article about uh, uh, grid forming inverters. <laughs> so microgrids and grid forming inverters, and the difference to uh, grid interactive inverters. Do you know how how this new standard works where inverters are capable of for forming a grid or yeah, building a grid? Oh, yeah. I, now that you mention it, I have seen some of that. I guess when I was looking at that, I was just thinking that they're, it's all semantics, you know, mm -hmm. that they're they're kind of trying to come up with terminology where in the world of microgrids, these grid or these inverters can be independent of the grid, but I don't know how that's any different than an interactive. Does anybody have any insight on that? Because I'm just talking without information there. Yeah, I, know, I was thinking in regards to like these uh, uh, virtual power plants. They're they're testing out, I think, in the northeast somewhere, where where these inverters are capable of working together and and forming a grid without without the utility yeah well we know that for sure you know because they're um we already see that in a grid interactive system they're operating without the utility so but they're typically operating independently yeah. so what you're saying is these things now have to begin to communicate with each other if you mm -hmm. have multiple systems operating in an independent form which isn't that much different really than working with the grid you know, yeah. if, if you're in com com combination with the grid, you're essentially in a grid forming system. Um, but I know the standards are having to, uh, I guess one of my takeaways from doing this system, and you're sort of alluding to it there, Siggy, is that this stuff's getting complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even at the residential level, um, you're starting to get into a lot of uh, communication devices talking with each other and and load management systems and and we haven't even gotten I talk about prioritizing the loads in the sunlight but then when you start integrating batteries and you do time of day pricing setups and uh, you know um, cleaning of the power and and dealing with demand charges and and all of that kind of thing it 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 really is a whole separate level uh, of complexity that and and what and we talk and we'll get into the communication devices but all these devices are now operating over a bluetooth system that's communicating so your combiner box is communicating with your battery bank and it's communicating with your smart switch and and it's communicating over your modem except now enphase wants you to put in a a mobile modem, uh, cellular modem into the system in case your local modem goes down. It's got a secondary backup uh, for data retention, but also for communication and all these systems have to work perfectly. And uh, 
nothing ever works perfectly as long as I install it anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So, uh, Gabe, I saw you pop up. Did you have a question or are you just? No, when, when y'all were talking about, um, generators, I was just going to add in that Enphase says a generator, running a generator with their microinverters will, will ruin the microinverters and possibly the generator as well. Okay. Well, they do have an application in the smart switch to integrate a generator. But yeah. again, I think the way that works is they shut down the system right. and then simply let the generator do everything you right. know, at that point. Cause, right. cause yeah, there is that problem of the generator can back feed in and, and overpower the inverters. Um, so you've got to have a lot of electronics in there to, uh, to protect that. So I, I, um, I've been doing a lot of work in this, in this area for a couple of reasons. One, I've been getting, our local installers have been putting a lot of uh, power walls in with um, end phase microinverters. And I've been getting into arguments as to whether um, they'll work off grid or, or not. You know, when the when the uh, grid goes down, whether you'll generate solar. And also, I have a client who has four different systems. One of them being a micro inverter, and then they have power walls, and those aren't working. And and so there's as much on the internet about whether you can have IQ sevens or IQ eights work off grid with power walls or not. Um, in the chat, I put in a, a Enphase technical brief um, link, so you can see the uh, what what Enphase says about integrating with uh, with power walls. Um, but as you've pointed out, it's become incredibly complex. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's interesting it's you bring that up because I just this morning got an email from someone asking or basically saying, I've installed this Enphase system and I'm just waiting for the Tesla Powerwall 3 to come out because I want to put that into my system. And I responded saying, you better double check that because I don't think they're compatible with each other. Um, you might be able to get it to work because they're both AC um, you know, coupled systems. They're both AC output. But this Bluetooth communication system is designed I mean, Enphase designed it to talk to the Enphase batteries. And so while you may get it to work, it may not have any or all of the features that that they claim for a system. They're really trying to get you to a proprietary system where you use Enphase products in every, every step of the way. Um, well, re read the brief that I put in the link. The um, What they've implied is so, you know, the power walls have their own gateway that disconnect it from the grid. And what they've implied is that um, the power wall can create a microgrid and that through the Envoy, you can change the parameters on the uh, microinverters to allow a broader range of acceptable grid signals and that then they'll keep working um just when they see the the power wall batteries um but again it's become incredibly complex and what i find is that my phone calls to enphase or other installers they have no clue you know yeah. you, you talk to the help desk and the uh, the technical enphase people just have no clue about how any of this works yeah, I would assume too that they would not necessarily support it with their warranty if you if you integrate it with something they didn't specifically design it to work with. So That's probably right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well let me let me proceed here. And again, I welcome all the uh all the interruptions. Uh that's that's the most fun <laughs> of this. So uh, I wanted to show you some of the outside stuff on the building. Here, this is uh, what's visible on the outside on our installation. There's the typical AC disconnect on the right, where we, um, you know, you go from the combiner box before it goes into the switch, so you can turn off your uh, solar array with that AC. That's typically required um, by any authority that you're installing. Uh, and then the other switch on the left is the um, the system disconnect. Uh, this is designed, it comes out of the smart switch 
And it's designed to turn off your batteries, to turn off the sunlight um, from the in-phase system uh, so that once the grid is down, this is designed to uh, shut everything down so that there's no power running through the building. If a first responder comes and has to start cutting through the wall for uh, venting of smoke or or something of that nature, this is your shutdown. So, And they've got to be located within, I believe it's like 10 feet of each other, uh, three meters. Uh, and you've got to have, you know, clearly marked and all of that good stuff. So, uh, and remember with these systems, you get into the six handle rule, which essentially says you can't have more than six handles to shut down uh, all the power in that facility. So residential, usually not a problem. But if you start getting into, you know, you've got battery systems, you've got the solar system, you've got the grid, you've got a generator, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe you've got several backup units, uh, you can get to six six handles pretty pretty quickly. So in those cases, you would have to have some sort of uh, disconnect aggregation where everything is in the same panel and you just turn it off with one with one switch. Okay, this shows you uh, just where these things are located uh, within easy sight of the meter. That's typically where the first responder is going to come into and you can see our hose and all the other junk that's already on the side of the wall there, typically like phone that nobody uses anymore and cable and, and all that other stuff. So it's all there, easily seen, well marked. So then in this particular house, this is an old Victorian building. So downstairs is where we tried to locate everything. And the downstairs is sort of a five and a half foot tall, uh, not quite a crawlway, but but you know, also something you're going to hit your head when you're walking around there. You can see the brick wall that this is mounted on. What I've got here on the right is the uh, combiner box. I'll get a little bit deeper in there. And on the left, that is the uh, the load management or the critical load panel, um, the, the end phase load management system. We'll look inside that here in a bit. All right. So inside the... Um, the end phase combiner box. Uh, this is what it looks like when you pop it open. A few uh, double pole breakers there. Uh, this system can handle up to four branch circuits, as I said. So there's space for four branch circuits in there, um, which you can utilize. Typically, it's also uh, has a 15 amp breaker that powers the communication system that's built into the upper right hand corner of this box. Now, what you're seeing here is a um, combiner box 4C, and the C stands for uh, communication, I guess. Um, but it's uh, that little um, thing in the bottom left-hand corner. Don't let them sell you an, uh, a combiner box 4. Okay, it's This is a more expensive unit. It adds a few hundred bucks to this unit, um, but... If you buy, if you have to buy the the cellular um, modem, that's going to set you back, you know, five hundred and some dollars. So you want that integrated in. If you have to buy the communication Bluetooth device, that's another hundred and twenty five bucks. So it's well worth it to pay the extra money for this four C, and you need that if you're doing sunlight backup or if you're doing. Um, batteries of any sort or any kind of AC coupled system uh, that's got to be got to be used. And I will tell you, the distributor that I dealt with <laughs> never mentioned such a thing. So, um, so we ended up having to uh, pay the extra to upgrade from the four to the four C uh, by adding in these systems. As an aside on this, you can't get by without the communication device. You can, in theory, get by without the cellular modem because that cellular modem is a backup system. And I was able to cajole the folks at Enphase um, to um, bypass that. They had to configure the system there at their site. So we had to link in and they did all of the voodoo that they do. Um, but we bypassed the cell um, modem, but I still have a feeling that that's going to cause me problems in the future because if I ever have to reset, now I've got to go back and promise them my firstborn and whatever else they desire because it was like a 
it was an interrogation to determine why on earth I was not willing to have a cellular modem. And really the bottom line was I didn't want to pay 550 bucks for something I wasn't going to use. That was my motivation, but they're not sympathetic to that motivation. Really, the only time that they're going to really be sympathetic to this is if you live in a region that has no cell service, nothing from anyone, then they're going to go, okay, fine. We guess you don't really need it. So that was a bit of frustration there. Uh, opening up the box here, um, inside you can see some of the um, some of the breakers that are servicing from the various branch circuits. The breaker that services the communication system is usually uh, installed in the middle of this, and it feeds that green bus bar that's that you can see there on the right. Um, that, when you hook up this system, you've got to disconnect from that, and then you're going to be powering this communication system from the smart switch, or you can do it from the um, backup load panel. So basically, they want there to be power when the grid is in standalone mode uh, to the communication system. So you have to redirect where the power that is powering that communication device is coming from. So typically, they recommend you just simply run those AC power lines in from the smart switch. You're going to use a breaker on the smart switch and feed it into that unit. And then just above there, you can't quite see it in that green line, is where your, your CTs, your um, uh, transformers uh, are wired in. There is a built-in uh, CT that, that you put line one from every branch circuit. It feeds through it. What that's doing is measuring how much power is being produced by each branch circuit and that gets fed into the communication device. So you can monitor power production in real time. And one other thing I should point out is those lockdown breakers. You'll see the screws that are going through that um, in the top of each of those breakers. They want you to use you know, lockdown breakers here so they cannot be removed while the system is energized. So make sure you get the right breaker because if you don't buy the one that's got a hole drilled through it, you're going to have to send it back and get the proper breaker. So uh, that's another thing to look out for there. Okay, then we jump into the smart switch. And this is what it looks like um, opened up when you're, when you're mounting that thing on the wall. And you should bear in mind this thing weighs like 80 pounds. So it's not exactly a job for one person to do. Um, so you've got to mount that in pretty solidly. I, I do have, uh, we'll jump in a little bit closer here. Um, I'll walk you through some of it, but then I've got a closer shot because there's a lot of stuff going on in here. The the silver thing up at the top, that's a um, that's the uh, neutral um, generating transformer. So um, basically it's saying, okay, it's coming in at 240, but when we're in island mode, we've got to be able to have 120 and 240. So it's got to have its own transformer inside to make that happen. And then behind that is a lot of electronic stuff that you don't access. In fact, most of the things at the top of the half of the box, you're not going to be doing anything with at all. Um, but if we jump in a little bit closer here at the bottom of the box, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see a red wire and a black wire. That's coming in from the main. So uh, in our case, it could be coming in from the utility. You can use this as your main disconnect. But if you do that, then you've got to mount a breaker um, right there in that space uh, that that is... Um, just below where those wires are terminated. So that becomes your main breaker. But in most cases, you're gonna be using a critical load panel. So we're gonna go with um, coming in from the main panel with you know, whatever the amperage of the system is that you're running. you know, um, And it's gonna be just like you were connecting in your solar array into the bottom, furthest away from the main, can exceed 120% of your main panel's um, uh, capacity. So all of those kind of things. I won't get too deep into that. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about there. 
So that's coming from your main panel in there. And then on the other side, you see the lugs where the line one and line two are um, leaving, and that's going to your critical load panel. So from its, from its most basic, this is bringing power in from the main panel and leaving to the critical load panel. So when the grid is operational, it's basically a pass-through to the critical load panel. Uh, power's coming in from your main, it's connecting into the critical load, so the main is live, the critical load panel's live, everybody's happy, and then when it loses sight of the grid, it disconnects from the main panel and only powers that critical load panel. There's one little weirdness there. If you're really observant, you'll notice that line one coming in from the main is on the right with line two on the on the left, and but leaving, line one is on the left and line two is on the right. So uh, why? I don't know. I'm sure there's some reason, but it's just kind of weird. Um, then coming in, you'll see the breakers up above that. Uh, those breakers, the one in the bottom right, is what's feeding the communication device in the um, uh, in the combiner box. So that's where we're getting power for that communication rather than within the combiner box itself. The one right above it is already hardwired in. That's up feeding the, uh, the transformer. And then on the left, we've got a breaker for your um, solar array and then a breaker for battery bank. Those are there. Now you don't connect from the combiner box there. You connect down at the bottom uh, and it goes through all the circuitry and then leaves through that breaker. Um, and you can put another breaker under those lugs um, that feed your, your critical load panel if you've got a critical load panel that has no main breaker sort of thing. So, so you can put your breaker for your critical load panel there if you want to. And then moving further down, I mean, you're going to see there's a neutral bus bar and a grounding bus bar. When the system comes, it's already bonded between the neutral and the um, and the uh, uh, ground lug bar. If if you're hooking into a main where there's already a bond between the neutral and the ground, you remove that bonding bar so you, that you're not bonding the neutral and the ground in more than the one location. Then underneath, down at the bottom, that's where you come in with your batteries, you come in with your generator, you come in with your uh, um, solar array. There are ports down below. It's very well marked. And then also um, there are a bunch of wires here that go out of the bottom there that go to your load management box. And then there are some wires that go to that um, DC main disconnect that's outside that I showed you before that that it's the emergency shutdown disconnect. So those get wired down there. So this is really what you're looking for in here. Getting a little bit complex, but once you've done it once or twice, I think it's gonna be pretty simple. Doing it the first time, it's it's a maze, um, you know, and, and a bit complicated. This is the box that is the um, load management system. So you're basically feeding wires in from your critical load uh, sub panel, and then you're feeding wires in from that smart switch. And that smart switch is where these things become prioritized. Uh, and then there's also a power thing for these switches um, to turn them on and off. Um, that's you know, it looks complicated. It's not overly complicated there. And then that feeds in. In this case, we've got our main panel on the left and then the critical load panel that was installed on the right that handles just the critical loads. And it gets wired directly into the uh, that load controller that's just off screen on the right there. And then the main box, uh, the main connection point that goes to the... Um, to the switch is the bottom left-hand breaker. You can see some relatively big wires running out of that. That's running over to um, to that switch. So um, I think that's kind of the whole system in a nutshell, at least how we ran into. I wanted to just point out some of the unexpected hurdles we ran into. Uh, the, the cell modem and the Bluetooth communication devices I already touched on, that was uh, annoying. 
um, but but could be overcome. Uh, problems with AEP have just been and continue to be a nightmare. Um, trying to get interconnection approval through their system where apparently it is operated by people who were too annoying to work at the Department of Motor Vehicles. And um, it's all in like DOS 1.0. And uh, they are clearly, there has to be a clear motivation within their system to make it as difficult as possible. Uh, that's all I can see. Um, and, um, and then I found out at the very last minute, which is always fun, that before we could commission our system, you've got to be certified by Enphase. And that proved not to be such an easy process um, because they, uh, for whatever reason, I did not fit their profile. That, that they were working. So you can't just go in and take the certification class and then take the test. You've got to be approved by them to be qualified to take their course. So when I started going through this, we exchanged five, six different email discussions, trying to convince them that I was worthy of taking their training. Um, it was amazingly annoying. And ultimately, I had to threaten to contact the president of Enphase and request that they refund the cost of my purchase because some moron in their training department was unwilling to let me use the system I had bought from them. And then suddenly the next morning, I got an email saying, you are approved. So that was the system having to go through that. Now, once you go through it, then it's not easy. And, and there's a lot of courses that were required. So let me just first off show you like AEP system. If anybody's gone through some of this, this is the beginning of it. Um, I guess a couple of things to point out. I started this process in April. I am still not approved. And in fact, this week, they kicked me back to step number one. So apparently, I have to now start all over again um, on this application. And each of the delay steps have been silly. Like my, my given name is Jerome, but I go by Jay. In one of the forms I filed, I used the name Jay and not Jerome. So they kicked it out and said I had to refile because my name did not match. Um, let's see, in another case, I did not indicate north on one of the diagrams, even though I did tell what the azimuth of the system was. So that all had to be redone. And every time there's a delay, there's about a week to two weeks between times for these people to actually communicate the issue. Plus, there's no way to get a hold of a human being in this system, no way to find out who to talk to. It, the only way I ever got a person was when they told me I was wrong and I just responded to that email. Um, so, so that part is annoying. Then if there's anything left out anywhere, any on any form in here, it will not let you go to the next step, but it won't tell you what you've missed or what you didn't do. So that was a bit of a random, just trying different things before it would let you go on to the next step. Ultimately, we got the approval to proceed. Then we um, got that. Now I'm trying to get them to commission the system. Well, when they when they came back, I had made a, a scanned a copy of the approval from the inspectors and submitted that, which was required. But then they came back and and they want pictures of the system and all the different bits and bobs and there's a lot of that stuff to comply with. Anyway, they just last week came back and said, oh, the thing you sent us from the inspectors is not is not acceptable. We need a formal note from them, which I got, and I sent them the link for it. But then they told me, nope, we can't take the link. You've got to submit it in the application. But then at the same time, they said, we see in your picture you only installed 15 panels, but the process was for 20. 
So I said, yeah, I wrote back and said, okay, this was just future proofing and we're going to see and all of that. And they said, nope, you've got to start all over and change everything to 15. <laughs> but kicking me back to the beginning, they then said that thing I'm supposed to submit, I could no longer submit because I'm not in a place where they allow me to submit documents. So, so this is where we're at. And from what I see, so far, it's 139 days into the process of trying to get approval from AEP. And it took two days to install the system. So, so AEP is requiring 140 days. And, uh, you know, the installers require two days. Uh, the other issue, Enphase certification, this just shows you the courses that I ended up having to go in and do the certification on this. And um, it was a wee bit harrowing only because, I mean, it, they're difficult and there's, it turns out after doing it, I can really see why they want you to go through certification because this is a complicated system. So it's helpful, but I would have liked to have known that up front instead of while I'm sitting there trying to get the commission commissioning done. But secondly, once you go in, Essentially, each of these sub modules has a quiz associated with it. And it says you must get 100% on every one of this or it kicks you out. But it doesn't tell you what, what happens. Like, are you no longer able to take the course? You know, I mean, it didn't, it wasn't clear. So I was able to get clarification where I guess it kicks you back to the beginning of the course. But, um, but a little bit more stressful than it needed to be. Now, fortunately, if you go into Quizlet, somebody has put all the right answers in there, so you can double check. But um, you know, it's it's a bit stressful. So uh, a lot, and it did take, I would guess, around eighteen hours of online training there. So uh, Jay, um, yeah, did you have to s upload a design of a uh, storage system? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. I had. I had to, yeah, create the storage system design and upload it. And clearly they went through that with a fine tooth comb because they they came back with, you know, hey, you didn't note that the wires had been moved from the combiner box over to the system controller, you know, for powering the communication device. And um, yeah, I mean, it was all very good learning. You know, it was a good learning experience, but it was it was it was detailed. Um, you just submitted pencil drawing or how you do that? Uh, what I did is I actually created um, using Microsoft Paint and I copied all the various components. And uh, then I use a program called uh, Page um, Page Page Plus. It's like a page maker self-publishing program. Mm. So so I did a very professional looking, looking thing because I wanted it as a template for future projects. But um, but it 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 took a you know a morning to put that drawing together, um, and normally they charge for that service. But as part of this, they give you one free, you know. Okay. But they require it. So that's that's our experience. Um, AEP <laughs> is still not letting us turn on the system, uh, no. but I did did turn it on and found everything works. So. Um, but now it's sitting there turned off until What's the name months. of that utility, the full name, uh, American electric power. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. There, um, there are, um, commercially operated, um, power system, I, uh, or power supplier utility. I'd be surprised. I'd like some feedback on it. I'm very tempted at the moment. I'm going to wait till they give me approval, but then I think I'm going to call our Senator's office and, and, uh, basically add my voice to uh, the fact that AEP obviously is purposefully trying to slow down the the adoption of, of solar. I'm well, sure not just at the residential, but at, at other levels as well. But they're not the only ones. I mean, Duke is doing that as well. They, they're looking for like the name is spelled wrong or the zip code is missing or something, or the legal name doesn't match the name on their, on their bill because the customer used their short name or something. So yeah, it's like delay tactics. Yeah, there's another delay that at the beginning, you fill out the form. And then if you don't go back in and check, there's a form that they post saying, oh, you now owe a fee. 
and you need to provide us with a mailing address because you can't pay this fee online. We're going to send you a bill in the mail and you have to then turn around and submit it by post. Um, but if you didn't know about it, you're going to be sitting there waiting for approval and you're and they're going, well, you haven't paid the fee, you know, so so there's lots of these silly things that are built into the system. All right. Anybody else have any final comments? I've run over just a wee little bit, but. Um, all right. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you all next Tuesday. All right. Take care.